family people a choice between living downtown and moving to the suburbs, they're going to take the suburbs every time. Why wouldn't they? More room, better services, and most of all, the suburbs are safe. At least, they're supposed to be. When a terrible crime takes place in a nice neighborhood, you have to ask yourself, was it an act of random violence? Or could there be a problem in the home? In true crime, investigation and conviction may take years. But every detective knows that the crucial clue is always there, somewhere in the first 72 hours. Just a few miles east of Seattle, Washington, Bellevue police receive a 911 call. Officer Jim Kowalsik responds. The radio dispatcher advised that some people had come home and they found bodies covered in blood. I was actually the second officer to arrive on the scene. The first officer had gotten there moments before me. And he was talking to two young males uh, out in front of uh, the house. Atif Rafay and his friend Sebastian Burns say they just found Atif's family dead in their home. They say they also heard noises. The killer may still be inside. So we kind of pushed the door open and just listened, you know, list, using our senses, uh, watching, trying to hear, even smell to see uh, was there anything to give an indication of what was going on or had gone in, in, the, in the house and we decided to go upstairs. We went up to the top of the landing and again stopped just to listen and watch and uh, see what we could see. What we saw was a man's body on a bed. On the wall behind the, the bed itself was a massive arc of blood and tissue. A very bloody scene. Uh, the man was obviously deceased. And he had no face. Beside the bed, there's an open wallet. My inclination was that this was someone that had just shot their, their, their head off with a shotgun. Like they just put their wallet down because they're not going to be able to recognize me, laid on the bed and blew my head off. The police continue their search. Down the hall, they hear a noise. Officer Kowalsik finds a second victim, a young woman. She's bleeding from a head wound, but still alive. He calls for paramedics. The young woman is rushed to hospital, but the search is not over. So then we went back and down the stairs. I hear Paul yell, I've got another one. The back of her head covering was soaked in blood. Police have found three victims, but no intruder. They returned to the dead man's room. Both Paul and I had thought, okay, this person had killed the two women, then went and laid on the bed and blew his head off. And his, his hand was up here by his, by his face, and we thought, well, maybe it was like a very powerful handgun. A 44 Magnum could cause that damage. The only problem is, no gun can be found. Something's wrong. If this was a homicide suicide, then somebody moved part of the evidence. I asked the officers that were sitting in, in the car with Atif and Sebastian to ask them if they moved anything. The boys insist they touch nothing inside the house. If that's the case, police are looking at a multiple murder. Homicide detective Bob Thompson arrives to take charge of the investigation. When I initially went in, I went downstairs, and uh, that's when I observed Mrs. Raffae. Thompson soon determines how Atif's mother was killed. She had two blows to the head. One was uh, in the back of her head, and the other was uh, just over her ear. 
Thompson also finds a VCR has gone missing from the family's home entertainment center. In Atif's sister's bedroom, Thompson notes something else. Just uh, a general observation of that room, there had been what looked like a struggle. There was impact where a weapon had hit the wall. She was fighting for her life in that room. In the master bedroom, Atif's father had no chance to put up a fight. It was clear that he was asleep at the time of the murder, and he never knew what hit him. He had been hit in the face numerous times, and I would just guess, you know, 40 to 50 times. The attacker never missed. On the carpet, Thompson finds a circular pattern of blood. It's about the same size as the top of a baseball bat. What you have is what initially looked like a burglary, which seemed incredible. It, I mean, that somebody come in in the middle of the night and steal a VCR and kill an entire family. Atif Rafay tells Detective Thompson he can't think of anyone who would want to hurt his family. They moved to Bellevue from Vancouver four months ago. His father, Tariq, was a structural engineer. His mother, Sultana, gave up her career as a dietitian to take care of his sister, Bosma, who's autistic and hasn't spoken since she was four. Atif explains that he's on summer break from university. He's been staying at Sebastian's house in Vancouver. They just drove down for a visit five days ago. He seemed to be very disengaged, I guess would be a, a word, which isn't all that uncommon for someone who's just observed the trauma of his entire family being murdered. Atif must now contact relatives and make funeral arrangements. Thompson is sympathetic. I had the impression that he just didn't want to deal with any of this. And ultimately what we did was we said, you know what, you know, you've been up all night long. We're going to put you up in a, a, a local hotel and you need to get some sleep. We'll come back and we'll talk to you later. Thompson needs to send the boys clothes to the lab. He has Officer Kowalsik bring them some new clothes. At first, Sebastian and Atif resist. Thompson explains they walk through the crime scene. Forensic analysis of their clothing is standard procedure. It's been a long night. When Thompson returns to his office, he gets a call from the hospital. Bosma Rafay has succumbed to her injuries. She was the only witness to the murders, and now she's gone. Three members of the Rafay family have just been found murdered in their Bellevue, Washington home. The sole survivor, Atif Rafay, says he was out with his friend Sebastian Burns at the time of the murders. Both have given statements the police must now verify. The pair say they left the Rafay's house at 8.30 and drove to Seattle, where they had coffee and dessert at a local restaurant. They left the cake restaurant walked across the street, went and saw a movie. They went to the 950 showing. After the movie, they said that they went to a all-night cafe. According to the waitress, they arrived there about 10 minutes to one. She says she remembers Atif and Sebastian very well. Sebastian was talkative and charming. He asked if there were any good nightclubs nearby. She suggested the weathered wall, just a few blocks away. They left her a big tip. Twenty minutes later, they came back to use the restroom. Sebastian told her the club was closed. They left the all-night cafe at 1.30 and drove back to Bellevue. Sebastian's 911 call was logged at 2.03. The boys' statements check out. The lab finds nothing unusual on their clothing. Detective Thompson has Officer Kowalsik drop by the motel to see how the boys are doing. 
And it looked like the light was on, so I knocked on the door, and Sebastian came to the door. He was wearing nothing but his uh, underwear, no shirt, and I noticed back in behind him was a thief standing there in his jockey shorts. I, I can't speculate anything other than they felt I was an intruder. I just asked him if everything was okay, do you need anything, and it was uh, Sebastian was obviously in charge, in that, at least in that room, and he just said, nope, we're fine, uh, leave us alone. The door was slammed in my face, so I left him alone. Kowalsik tells Detective Thompson about the boy's behavior. Thompson says he finds something else odd. The first four nights the boys were in town, they stayed home and watched TV. Why so much activity on the night of the murders? We decided, you know what, let's just wait. The following day was going to be the funeral. We had family coming into town, uh, and they may be able to provide some more insight into who may be responsible. The next day, Thompson sends a forensic team to the Raffae house to gather more evidence. Lead forensic investigator, Kay Sweeney, zeroes in on the blood on the floor. I noted there was a drip pattern. It didn't look like a wound because it was fairly infrequent blood dripping, so it was more probably a weapon, some implement that was bloody that was dripping. The drops of blood lead from Tariq Rafay's bedroom to every outside door in the house. That indicates someone is checking to see the doors are locked. Uh, more likely than someone intends to spend some time inside the residence. And one of the reasons for spending time on the scene, beyond searching for valuables and taking them, is to clean up. Sweeney sprays leucomalachite on the bathroom walls. Green would indicate the presence of blood. And when I sprayed that shower stall, it lit up like a Christmas tree. Green specks all over the walls. Clearly, someone covered in blood took a shower here. In examining the bathroom, of course, I'm interested not only in the blood spatter and blood stains, but also if there's any hair. Sweeney finds a light brown hair that may well belong to the killer. In Tariq Rafay's bedroom, Sweeney analyzes the blood spatter to see what else he can find. I used straight line angle determination and determine an arc of swing. And in, term, in determining that arc of swing, then I can determine the height of a person swinging the bat. And the height of that person, uh, based on the arc of the swing, was six feet or more. Sweeney believes he now knows two things about the killer. He's six feet tall, and he has light brown hair, just like Sebastian Burns. I advise the investigators not to let the two boys out of their sight. Thompson sends an officer to the funeral to keep an eye on the boys. But Atif and Sebastian don't show up. We went back to the hotel, found that they weren't at the room, and um, it was a short time later we learned that they had just crossed the border into Canada. They were bound for Vancouver from Seattle on a Greyhound. 72 hours after the murders, Detective Thompson's prime suspects have fled the country. are looking for Atif Rafay and Sebastian Burns, the two prime suspects in the Rafay family murder case. The day after they fled the United States, Detective Bob Thompson arrives in Vancouver, BC. We contacted the local agency there to let them know we were in town. And uh, we were going around with them. They were helping us out with addresses. Thompson learns the boys are staying at a high school friend's condo. The detective wants to know why Atif and Sebastian disappeared. Do they have something to hide? Sebastian is outraged at the insinuation. He says he and Atif have done nothing wrong. We wanted hair and uh, blood samples from Burns and Rafay that we could use to match things that we had found at the crime scene. And ultimately, our conversations with them broke down to the point that they wouldn't speak to us. We found that no matter where we went, they were telling other people, don't talk to the police. Detective Thompson decides to visit Atif and Sebastian's old high school. One particular school teacher enlightened us, and she said, 
that they were arrogant people that would cause trouble for other people at their expense, which didn't mean that they were murderers, but it wasn't painting a picture that was very attractive either. That's not the only thing Thompson learns. Looking through a year-old high school annual, Sebastian Burns had been in a play that was called Rope. Rope is based on the famous Leopold and Loeb case, in which two young male lovers attempt to commit the perfect murder. When you read something like that, I mean, that, I mean, that piques your interest. Forensic psychologist Stephen Hart is familiar with the case. Tifa Fay and Sebastian Burns actually developed a friendship in high school um, where they saw each other as having somewhat complementary skills or abilities. On their own, individually, uh, they may have been uh, a little bit of, of uh, an outcast, a little bit of a loser. It seems like once they hooked up, they started to develop a real sense of power. Rafay and Burns have been getting a lot of media attention in Vancouver. The uh, Royal Canadian Mounted Police uh, were reading in the newspapers about a couple of murder suspects running around in Vancouver. We met with the RCMP and told them about the case investigation that we had. They wanted to know what the Bellevue Police Department needed from them. The RCMP know that even though the murders were committed in the United States, they may well have been planned in Canada. The RCMP are happy to help. They set up a sting operation and put their man in place. The RCMP operative introduces himself as Frankie. He says he recognizes Sebastian from all those articles in the papers. Sebastian tells Frankie it's all a crock. He's innocent. After a few drinks, Sebastian says he and his friend Atif plan to make a movie about two young men who have been wrongly accused of murder. But movies are expensive, and Sebastian has no money. No one will hire him right now because of all the bad press. Frankie says he has underworld connections. If Sebastian wants to come work for him, he can make some easy money. Over the next several months, the undercover officer immerses Sebastian and Atif in a make-believe world of money laundering and drugs. Frankie then springs the trap. He says he has a job for them. If they eliminate a rival drug dealer for him, he'll pay them, big time. But first, he needs to know if the accusations are true. Are they killers? After stonewalling for months, Atif and Sebastian are eager to open up. Not only did they confess to it, but they were laughing about it when they were confessing. They showed no remorse at all. Um, they, they showed no um, emotion. In the police video, Atif explains how they planned everything to the last detail. It was to be the perfect crime. They bought tickets to the 950 movie, but they never intended to see it. Instead, they slipped out the exit and immediately returned to the Rafay house to commit the murders. They knew Atif's father would be asleep by that time. Sebastian is the stronger of the two. He would do the dirty work. They strip down to their underwear to avoid getting blood on their clothes. Atif's mother was an embarrassment to him. She'd thrown away her life to look after his feeble-minded sister. It made him sick. Atif's father was a devout Muslim who opposed his choices in life. Atif wanted to make movies. His father wanted him to be an engineer. Sebastian boasts how smart he and Atif were. They left his artistic sister for last because they knew she couldn't cry out for help. Then they got in the shower and washed away all traces of the murders. 
or so they thought. When they went to the all-night cafe, they deliberately left a large tip, so the waitress would remember them. At 2 a.m., they returned home to discover the horrific murders. Then they called 911. Frankie asks how it felt. They say killing the family was inconvenient, but it had to be done. They needed financing for their movie, The Great Despisers. The Rafay's insurance policies and the estate was worth uh, nearly half a million dollars. In order for Atif Rafay to get access to the inheritance, his entire family had to die. Money may be um, the manifest motive, but the latent motive is really about taking power and control, exerting power and control in the family. In a sense, taking out the existing power structure of a family. They despised other people. They wanted to feel superior to other people. They wanted to feel separate and apart and distinct from other people. Now they will be. Atif Rafay and Sebastian Burns will spend the rest of their lives in a Washington state penitentiary. The stories on 72 Hours are true. The detectives and forensic scientists are the ones who actually worked on the case. Life in a small town is supposed to be predictable. That's the beauty of it. Every day, the same faces, the same places, the same routine. Everything makes sense. Until one night, a school librarian returns home as usual, has a bite to eat, and then, without warning, vanishes. Suddenly, nothing makes sense. In true crime, investigation and conviction may take years. But every detective knows that the crucial clue is always there, somewhere in the first 72 hours. have been called to the home of school librarian Sylvia Thompson. The school principal says she didn't show up for work this morning. She didn't call in sick either. My concern started about five minutes after the time that she usually arrived. Sylvia normally greets the children first thing every morning. She's never late. The fact that she wouldn't be there without letting us know was very uncharacteristic. Uh, it was like clockwork. Uh, the buses would roll in at 20 to 9. She was there. And uh, I can't remember any day that she missed this duty. The principal says he called Sylvia repeatedly, but she didn't answer. He decided to go round to her house when he got no answer there, his next call was to the police. The local constable asks detectives Jim Miller and Sean Evans to investigate. Inside the house, police find Sylvia's coat, boots, and purse. Why would she leave home without them? The rest of the house was impeccably clean and tidy. 
There was a gas fireplace that was on uh, with the flame burning. There was uh, one Lazy Boy recliner, beside which was a small side table. On that side table was a tray, uh, some dishes that had remnants of a meal. The principal says it's not like Sylvia to leave behind dirty dishes or forget to turn off her fireplace. The detectives ask if Sylvia seemed upset about anything recently. Did she ever mention going away? There were no thoughts of her being depressed or, or of such, especially since she just celebrated her 50th birthday. She was in a very cheerful mood. So there was no indication to us that there was anything where she would perhaps have left for any kind of reason. The principal then notices something missing. Sylvia had two recliners in her living room, not just one. The detectives are concerned. If you decide to disappear, why would you take a recliner with you? News of Sylvia's disappearance has spread. Neighbors come forward, anxious to help police. She was last seen by a neighbor going into her home 7, 7.30 in the evening, and then the next morning she's nowhere to be found. The community was quite upset about somebody had gone missing out of their home. One of there's uh, some wild person on the loose abducting people. Police decide Sylvia's disappearance merits a full investigation. She's declared a missing person. The school community, of course, became quite concerned. And there was a lot of concern about the children being traumatized by this. Children just loved to be with her. She was very caring, and she listened very carefully to children. She was a very professional teacher, and it showed. I mean, it showed in everybody that we interviewed uh, just how much of an impact she had on so many people's lives. Rumors start to circulate. Some people are even saying Sylvia's been killed. There was tips from uh, people that they said that uh, she was dumped on along the roadside on certain roads. Uh, that she was dumped in a pond, uh, kind of southwest of town. Townspeople fear the worst. With police help, they form a search party and comb the area. I don't think any of us believed that we would find a body. We believed we would find some kind of clue however trivial that might, may have be some of assistance. Of course, in the back of your mind, you always harbor that uh, intrepidation. If Sylvia was ever in the vicinity, all signs of her have vanished. The search is called off. One searcher then comes forward with new information. He tells police he's the stepson of Sylvia's border. His stepmother has been away on holiday for several weeks. The evening before Sylvia disappeared, he went by her house to see if his stepmother had returned. Sylvia said she hadn't. The young man tells police Sylvia then invited him in for a visit, but she asked him to leave at eight. She said she was expecting someone. Police want to know who that someone might be. Police conduct a complete forensic examination of Sylvia's house. We had a forensic identification team uh, come in looking for any kind of evidence that may assist us with the disappearance of the victim or any suspects that may have been in the house. The identification team finds 12 shoe prints. Police eliminate the prints of anyone who entered the house after Sylvia disappeared. They expect to find Sylvia's shoe prints and those of her unknown visitor. That's not what happens. Their prints have vanished. But the forensic examination isn't over. I sprayed the floor with luminol, and luminol is a 
blood enhancement chemical that is used in order to locate blood. This chemical basically glows in the dark. The officer discovers a blood smear under the couch. Two blood profiles later emerge. They determined uh, through examination at the Center of Forensic Sciences was a combination of uh, male and female blood. The female blood sample belongs to Sylvia Thompson. The source of the male blood is unknown. Police are now certain Sylvia is the victim of a violent attack. The question is, by whom? In a small town, a school librarian has vanished. Physical evidence suggests foul play, but no body has been found. There was a candlelight vigil, just to give some relief to people, because as time went on, despair set in, and prayer did help. From the perspective of, of fear, uh, people not knowing uh, you know, if there was some person loose in the community that was breaking into homes, uh, certainly affected the, the neighborhood she lived in. And everybody in, in the small community was certainly had a lot of concern, asking us if they should be afraid for their lives. Police receive hundreds of tips. Every one of them needs to be chased down. And we had a number of phone calls from uh, people that lived within the immediate area and about observations they made of the victim's residence on the 5th of January, 1998. Neighbors report seeing a pickup truck in front of Sylvia's house at midnight. Although the, the descriptors of the truck did somewhat vary, they were fairly consistent in that it was a small pickup truck with some distinctive marks on it. Investigators realize they've already spoken with the truck's owner. He is Martin Edelenboss, the last person to see Sylvia Thompson before she disappeared. Midnight sightings of his truck in front of her house would conflict with his statement that he left at 8 p.m. Police run a check on Martin. He's done time for sexual assault and is out on parole. When I had my discussion with the parole officer, she had nothing but good things to say about uh, this individual, that he had uh, um, been a model parolee. There had never been an issue as far as uh, a breach of conditions. She had no concerns about him being uh, in the public. Police learn Martin Edelenboss is a heavy equipment operator at a nearby landfill site. A better place to hide incriminating evidence would be hard to find. Police need to know more. We decided the following morning that we would start to send some investigators down there uh, to start to do some interviews. Investigators ask what happened here on January 6th, the day of Sylvia Thompson's disappearance. A driver remembers seeing Martin early that morning when the driver came on shift. Investigators ask him if he saw Martin dump any garbage that morning. The driver says he didn't see Martin dump anything. It's a busy site. Police conclude that if Martin dumped something, someone here would have seen him. Investigators then learn a nearby power plant is protected by security cameras. All trucks going in and out of the landfill site are monitored. We uh, obtained copies of those uh, videotapes and uh, found a vehicle coming in around four, quarter to four in the morning. The tape shows someone dumping something, but the images aren't clear. The pickup truck looks a lot like Martin's. Investigators returned to the landfill site. They need to know Martin's exact movements that morning. On that particular day, he was not supposed to start work uh, until 7 a.m. Uh, he, in fact, had arrived early we started to learn of some very peculiar behavior that he had exhibited at the landfill site on the morning, the 6th of January. The driver now tells police that when he arrived at the site that morning with a load of garbage, Martin insisted it be dumped in a specific spot. Martin then went round to the rear of the truck to watch the load being dumped. 
this was a very significant safety violation within the tipping area. So this was something that uh, he should not have been doing. Was there something at the landfill site that Martin wanted to hide? Police believe there was. I had a pretty good gut feeling that he was in there disposing of the chair or the body or both. If Martin used his truck to transport Sylvia's body to the dump, a forensic examination will prove it. Police seize the vehicle. An identification officer searches Martin's truck for physical evidence. Blood causes luminol to glow, but so does rust. The truck bed is so rusted out, there's no way to distinguish one from the other. Sylvia may have been in the truck, but the investigators can't prove it. To make the case, they've got to find her body. They mount a massive search. There was thousands and thousands of tons of garbage dumped uh, a day in that landfill site. And um, it was just uh, a huge task even to, to, to try and take it on. We taped off an area probably about the size uh, of two football fields where we were going to commence our, our search. And uh, I wanted to go down uh, 20 feet we searched there on seven days a week through all kinds of weather. The stench from the, from the landfill site was horrendous. We found numerous rose-colored chairs. You know, I didn't believe there was that many uh, rose-colored chairs around. On day 36 of the search, investigators find the remnants of one more chair. There was a label stapled to the wood on the chair that had the victim's name on it. That even gave me a uh, stronger indication then that, that, uh, that the victim was probably in there somewhere as well. Police need to keep close tabs on their prime suspect. But Martin Edelin boss has left town. Police learn he's in Niagara Falls, where he's just been arrested for drunk and disorderly conduct at a strip club. By leaving his hometown, Martin has violated the terms of his parole. He's picked up just 100 yards from the U.S. border. We believe that he might be trying to maybe run across the border and disappear. Police don't have enough evidence to hold Martin, but they warn him that if he breaks parole again, he'll be taken into custody. Two months after Sylvia was declared missing, the search area has been excavated to a depth of 20 feet. I made a decision to uh, go back another uh, 50 feet and go down another 10 feet. I don't think I was not very popular with the searchers at the time, but they knew it had to be done. I left the landfill site probably about two o'clock that afternoon and uh, at about five minutes after four, I got a call from the supervisor at the landfill site saying, you better come down here right away. We found something you'll be interested in. I went in and, and looked at what they had found. The body was partially involved in a piece of carpet. We believed it was the person that we were looking for. After a two-month-long search, investigators have discovered what they believe to be the body of missing librarian Sylvia Thompson. The remains are sent to pathologist Martin Queen. The direct comparison of the pre-mortem dental x-rays and the post-mortem dental x-rays will lead to a definitive identification of the victim. In the small town, the discovery of Sylvia's body hits hard. We, in a lot of ways, of course, had been expecting the worst. Yeah, that's only natural after so much time. But that didn't lessen the impact and the, the grief that was shared. 
Investigators believe Martin Edelin Boss is Sylvia's killer, but they have no physical evidence connecting him to the crime. They decide to test his truck a second time. To find blood that has not been contaminated by rust, they take the truck apart. Hidden in the wheel well, having entered through a crack in the truck bed, the examiner finds blood. DNA tests reveal the blood matches that of Sylvia Thompson. We determined that, that we had sufficient evidence to, to arrest Mr. Edelin Boss for, for first degree murder. And uh, I attended the scene and placed the accused under arrest. Less than 72 hours into their investigation, Martin Edelin Boss introduced himself to police as a concerned friend. Now, police know exactly how he killed Sylvia Thompson. What we learned was that uh, early on at work, the accused was involved in some consumption of alcohol. He picked up a carpet at the landfill site. Not too drunk to drive. Not too drunk to find his way to Sylvia's house. He knew her border was away. That meant Sylvia would be alone. He knew she would remember him from her party. Upon arriving at the home, he uh, knocked on the door. He was invited into the residence, and very shortly thereafter, there was uh, a physical assault. She was strangled with significant force and was then raped. Why the accused did what he did, you know, the only thing I, I can say on that is he acknowledged that he went to the home that night specifically to have intercourse with the victim and he was fully prepared to use force. The accused remained within the victim's home for several hours during which time he had uh, undertaken some steps to clean up. But Martin missed a spot, leaving a trace of his DNA behind. We believe that he had took the body to the Keel Valley landfill site at four o'clock in the morning, dumped it in there. He got rid of the blood spattered recliner at the same time. When the first driver arrived at six that morning, Martin directed him over to Sylvia's body. Martin believed he'd made Sylvia vanish, but he was wrong. She is still remembered. Children just loved her, and there were hugs often given to her. She was a gifted teacher. Every time one of her students reads a story, Sylvia lives on. For the crime of first-degree murder, Martin Edlin Boss is currently serving 25 years with no possibility of parole. The stories on 72 Hours are true. The detectives and forensic scientists are the ones who actually worked on the case. in a new country can be sweet. Just ask Amrik Singh Gadwar. The young salesman has a senior business partner showing him the ropes. He has a good family. He has a beautiful wife. 
He has a lot to be thankful for. Tonight, he'll take a special pill, just so his wife will have something to be thankful for as well. But tonight's the night all the young immigrants' dreams will end. Crime, investigation, and conviction may take years. But every detective knows that the crucial clue is always there, somewhere in the first 72 hours. <laughs> Hamilton, Ontario is home to many new Canadians. One of them, Amrik Singh Gadwar, has just turned up dead. The coroner rules he died of unexplained natural causes. One month after Amrik's death, his business partner, Sukhwinder Singh Dillon, files an insurance claim on Amrik's life. Insurance claims agent Clifton Elliott is assigned to the case. When he arrives at the business partner's house, Elliott has a sense of deja vu. I just glanced over as I was parking and noticed there was two statues at the bottom of the steps leading up to the door. And I suddenly had a feeling I'd been there before. I rang the doorbell and Mr. Dillon came to the door. I didn't recognize who he was immediately, but I knew I'd seen him before. Dylan tells Elliot he and Amrick had life insurance policies on each other because they were in business together. They sold used cars from the driveway of Dylan's house. Normally, the payment of this kind of claim is straightforward, but not this time. The fact that I'd seen Mr. Dillon before and I'd been to the residence bothered me to the extent I thought, no, I'm going back to the office. I checked the files under the deceased name, but there was nothing. So I checked them under Dillon and I pulled a file on a Mrs. Dillon. 18 months earlier, Dylan's wife had gone into convulsions and died. The coroner ruled she died of unexplained natural causes. Dylan collected over $200,000 in insurance. It was too much of a coincidence for two people to die under the same circumstances without there being an explanation. Elliot turns over the information to Dr. Chitra Rao, his contact at Hamilton General Hospital's pathology department. She decides to run some tests. When I was in medical school in India, I've seen lots of these cases. Being victims of Indian origin, um, first thing came to my mind was, could it be chloroform, could it be arsenic, could it be strychnine? All you need is five milligrams of strychnine to get toxic effects. And within five to 10 minutes, the patients will go into spasm and convulsions. They die of respiratory and then cardiac arrest. Three days later, the lab results are ready. I got a call from the toxicologist and say, hey, what you guessed was right. He does have strychnine in his uh, bloodstream. The presence of poison in Amrick's bloodstream means Hamilton police now have a murder case on their hands. Detective Warren Coral is assigned to investigate the death of Dylan's business partner, Amrick Singh Gadwar. Coral is also interested in the death of Dylan's wife. I'd learned that these two people who had died really had no medical history that, that uh, should cause them to die the way that they did. Um, it was suspicious. Coral orders toxicology tests on the remains of Dylan's wife. No strychnine is found. The cause of her death remains a mystery. Thank you. 
Coral decides to focus on the murder of Amrik Singh Gadwar. Coral and his partner, Kevin Dinsa, pay a visit to Amrik's family and his widow, Jasminder. They need to find out more about Amrik's relationship with his business partner. Police learn Dylan and Amrik were very close. Even though Dylan wasn't a blood relative, Amrik called him uncle. Police also learn Dylan has promised Amrik's family the entire $100,000 insurance settlement. Clearly, any suspicions Dylan stood to benefit personally from Amrik's death are unfounded. Police ask family friends what happened the night Amrik died. We had learned that uh, the victim had sold a vehicle on that day. They bought some alcohol and they were sort of celebrating this sale. At one point during the evening, Amrik complained of back pain. We had learned that there was some discussion about him taking some sort of a pill that his grandmother had actually given him at that time. He showered, he shaved, and then he went to bed with his wife. Him and his wife actually had sexual intercourse prior to him attempting to go to sleep. It was at that time that he went into convulsions that are specific to strychnine poisoning. Jasminder cried out for help. Amrik's family came running. Amrik died within hours. Police are told Jasminder and Amrik had a stormy marriage. Jasminder had threatened to leave with their son a number of times. The victim didn't treat her very well. His family did not treat her very well. We had learned that in fact she was an abused woman in that household. The detectives know poisoning is an intimate crime. You have to be close to someone to poison him. Who was the last person with this individual? It was obviously the wife. She was the last person with the victim. So we had three people that uh, we had to take a step back and take a look at to see who, in fact, may have had the motive to murder this uh, victim. Was it the wife with the troubled relationship? The grandmother who had given Amrik the pill? Or the business partner who was holding an insurance policy on his life? and Dinsa believe family members know the answer, but they're not telling. A young man named Amrik Singh Gadwar has been murdered. Hamilton police have three suspects, his business partner, his grandmother, and his wife. Amrik's business partner, Sukhwinder Singh Dillon, stood to make $100,000 on the insurance, but he has since promised that money to the victim's family. Amrik's grandmother reportedly gave Amrik a pill just before he died. She now stands to get a share of the insurance money. Amrik's wife, Jasminder, had many grievances against her husband and his family. A family friend tells police at the visitation after Amrik's death, she witnessed an argument between Jasminder and Dylan. For an Indian woman, especially a daughter-in-law living under her in-law's roof, to be so outspoken is virtually unheard of. Amrik's grandmother soon ended the argument. But Jasminder's behavior is very different around the police. She was very submissive, always looked down, wouldn't make eye contact, which is not suspicious itself, but too submissive. 
Jasminder seems anxious to avoid any contact with the police. When police press the family for more information, none is forthcoming. Police decide polygraph tests are in order for all three suspects. First up is Amrik's wife, Jasminder. When asked, did you poison your husband? She answers no. But when asked if she knows who did, her answers become vague. She looked as if she had something to say, but she wasn't going to share it with us. Dinsa believes Jasminder is probably not the killer, but he thinks she knows who is. Amrik's grandmother doesn't understand how the polygraph works. Police decide to question her instead. She too is vague and evasive. Police come away thinking she has something to hide. Amrik's business partner, Dylan, refuses to answer any more questions halfway through the test. He knows police can't force him to take a polygraph. Amrik's family is becoming impatient. They want to know when they can collect the insurance money. The police are happy to provide an answer when Dylan agrees to a polygraph test. And we confronted him in a manner in front of the family, and the family says, well, you can take him right now. And of course, it, Dylan knew that to keep face with the family, he had to take a polygraph. When asked if he was involved in Amrik's death, Dylan denies knowing anything. And he failed the polygraph. But failing a polygraph is not proof of guilt. The detectives decide to press harder. We interviewed this individual for 13 hours keeps telling me that he hasn't done anything wrong, he's not responsible for it. We tell him that he's still lying to us. Coral obtains a warrant to search Dylan's house. We were gonna vacuum every inch of that house and then take a look inside of that vacuum bag to see whether in fact there was strychnine in it. Police find no evidence of strychnine in the house but they do find something else. We actually found videotapes of other wives that he had married in India after his own wife's death. Dylan remarried three times in quick succession. Police learn all three wives died under suspicious circumstances. After we learned about these things, we realized that investigatively, there was a lot of similar fact evidence that could be gleaned from traveling to India and doing our own investigation over there. We traveled to different parts of northern Punjab, basically tracing Dylan's movements. What police learn in India shocks them. Dylan married one woman who bore him twins who died while in his care. While still married to her, he took a second wife. She too died from what looks to have been strychnine poisoning. Detective Dinsa has no trouble buying strychnine locally. Dime size, brown colored, the raw form, very poisonous. And they cost roughly about 25 cents Canadian, enough to uh, kill a community. The Indian leg of the investigation is over. Police return home convinced Dylan is a killer. But just because he can be connected to suspicious deaths in India doesn't mean he can be arrested for his business partner's murder in Canada. The day after their return, investigators get a call from Jasminder. Amrik's widow tells Detective Coral that after a violent argument with her in-laws, she has fled their house for the safety of a women's shelter.
she's upset. She had to leave her son behind. Jasminder says she's ready to talk to police about what happened the night of Amrik's murder. She was now coming forward to tell us the truth. Police know what Jasminder has to say could break the case wide open. A young widow is prepared to tell police what happened the night of her husband's murder. Jasminder says after the celebration, Amrik came to bed. He then told Jasminder a secret. Dylan had given him a special pill to help him perform better in bed. Shortly after they had sex, Amrik went into convulsions and died. Jasminder says she told Amrik's family about the pill. But because of the insurance money Dylan has promised them, they're keeping quiet. Jasminder says she tried to confront Dylan herself, but he denied her accusations. Can police trust her? They come up with a plan that will enable her to get her son back, and then to hear for themselves what the family has to say. We got an East Indian speaking officer who actually some, uh, doesn't look uh, East Indian. We told him that he was to assist the Children's Aid Society in assisting the victim to retrieve some belongings and her child from the victim's home. We told him to listen to what the conversation was in the house. He was not to say anything that would suggest that he was East Indian, that he understood what was being said. We learned the victim's wife had been told that you will not cooperate with the police. You will not do anything that would allow us not to get that money. The family threatened to tell police it was Jasminder, not Dylan, who gave Amrik the poison pill. We believe we had a pretty compelling case. After a year-long investigation, police arrest Dylan for Amrik's murder. The police are convinced Dylan killed his first wife as well, but they need proof. Coral asks for a second test for strychnine to be done on Dylan's wife's tissue. Dr. Joel Mayer, toxicologist at the Center for Forensic Sciences, examines the tissue samples. Since the first tests were done, new technologies have been developed. The samples went through their final preparation stage. The results of the analysis clearly showed that strychnine was present in the tissue blocks obtained from the deceased wife. Police now know how Sukhwinder Singh Dillon committed the murders. First, he brought strychnine tablets back from India. He then used a mortar and pestle to grind them into powder. He put the poison into gelatin capsules which he then deceived his victims into taking. And the worst thing about it is strychnine is such a terrible death. It's a death that nobody should die. Detectives met the killer within the first 72 hours of their investigation, but it took them a year to collect enough evidence to arrest him. Dylan murdered his wife in Canada for the insurance money. Police believe he murdered his wives in India for their dowries. He then returned to Canada to look for his next victim. He'd gotten away with the death of his wife. He figured that I got insurance money from my wife's death, so I'm gonna take an insurance policy out on my business partner. Had it not been for the long memory of an insurance agent, police believe Dylan might have kept on getting away with murder. The night Amrik died, there was another hitch in Dylan's plan. He never expected Amrik to live long enough to tell his wife about the pill. Dylan had no choice but to promise the family the insurance money. 
He had to deflect suspicion away from himself. Because of the promises that Dylan had made, the family chose to keep that wall of silence up, thinking that we've lost our son anyhow. We might as well look after who's now living. In the end, the family's plan also came up short. The police investigation into Amrick's murder revealed Dylan had lied to the insurance company. He and Amrick were not blood relatives. They weren't legal business partners either. The insurance policy was deemed invalid. Amrick's parents and grandparents who had hidden the truth about Dylan were left with nothing. Jasminder has been shunned by Amrick's family. She now lives alone with her son. Actually, she's a true hero in this investigation. She came forward, did the right thing. Sukhwinder Singh Dillon was convicted of the murders of Amrik Singh Gadwar and Rupinder Kaur Dillon, his first wife. He is serving two life sentences in a federal penitentiary. The stories on 72 Hours are true. The detectives and forensic scientists are the ones who actually worked on the case. says charity shall cover a multitude of sins but a killer will settle for a dark night a remote location and the promise of a long cold winter in december of 1996 a trucker pulls into a rest stop in northern ontario First, he discovers it's closed for the season. Then he discovers something he was never meant to find. In true crime, investigation and conviction may take years. But every detective knows that the crucial clue is always there, somewhere in the first 72 hours. A body has just been found north of Bracebridge, Ontario. Local detectives Dan Mulligan and Kelly Grubb are assigned to the case. The area where it was placed, I know that area very well. At night, it looks like you're in the middle of nowhere. We found uh, a lady of East Indian descent. There weren't any identifying uh, features whatsoever left on the body. There wasn't any jewelry. There wasn't any rings on her fingers. There wasn't any wallet or purse or anything identifiable uh, of any nature whatsoever. For the detectives, everything points to murder. So the next stage was to send out a broadcast uh, to police agencies uh, throughout Ontario and Canada to identify who the victim is. Mulligan and Grubb are the first detectives on the scene. They'll follow the case wherever it leads. Tonight, that means taking the body several hundred kilometers south to Toronto for an autopsy. Thanks to the cold weather, the body has been well preserved. Pathologist Martin Queen is able to identify a number of injuries. There were several blunt force injuries. However, there were no classic defensive wounds. This suggests that the victim was involved in a struggle, but was not able to respond and defend herself. On the victim's neck, there are abrasions, 
In her eyes, there is blood. The cause of her death is found to be asphyxia, due to manual strangulation. Brownish stains were identified on both hands. The exact nature of these were not clear to me. However, they were swabbed for ultimate DNA examination. On the breast area, there were numerous very unusual skin lesions, which at the time of the autopsy, I could not clearly identify. The detectives have the cause of death and some intriguing clues, but they don't know the victim's identity. A missing persons officer calls Grubb later that day and tells him to turn on the local news. A Toronto man seeks the public's help in finding Nandita Advani, his common-law wife. He gives a detailed description of her that includes the jewelry she was wearing. He says Nandita went shopping six days ago and never came home. Mulligan and Grubb travel to Nandita's home in Little India. Their next step is a painful one, breaking the news of her murder to her common-law husband, Shashi Sharma. Shashi Sharma's 25-year-old son, Junior, answers the door. He asks the detectives to wait for his father to complete his devotions. Junior says Sharma Sr. is a Hindu priest and a doctor of herbal medicine, a pandit. A number of people in various cultures had considerable faith in the healing powers of a pandit. And people would come to him and pay him uh, significant sums of money to perform this, what, what they called a puja. And that was this spiritual healing ceremony. In different ways, both men are distraught to learn of Nandita's death. Father had a certain aloofness about him, a very strong confidence. Junior, on the other hand, was extremely surprised when we informed him that we had just found the victim. Do they know of anyone who might want to hurt Nandita? Both men say no, at least not anymore. Senior tells the detectives that before Nandita lived with him, she was married to an abusive husband. He uh, essentially pointed the finger in the direction of the victim's former husband, whom she had been separated from for approximately two year period. He indicated that there had been domestic problems. Sharma Senior used the power and respect he commanded as a pandit to help Nandita leave the relationship. He took her into his home. Over time, love blossomed. For the past two years, they've lived together as man and wife. The detectives have one more request of the Sharmas. Naturally, the current common law partner of, of somebody who's died of suspicious nature um, is an immediate person of interest. They ask father and son to provide DNA samples. They both, on their consent, provided us with saliva samples, and readily did so. It was most definitely a learning experience for us. We don't have a lot of the East Indian culture in Muskoka, so we had to adjust to uh, dealing with a new culture on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Police interview Nandita's ex-husband. The ex-husband was extremely concerned about the fact that we had found his former wife murdered. He, he was obviously saddened by that fact, and, and that, uh, that appeared to us to be very genuine at the time. We confirmed his whereabouts during that given time period, and we were quite content with the alibi that he provided us with. Sixteen hours into the investigation, the police have no suspects. We fan out and we interview as many people as possible in as short a time as possible, and we learn as much as possible. We start conducting interviews with people trying to determine things like the last time the victim was seen. The difficulties primarily involve communicating with a culture that traditionally not that forthright with police to begin with. By the same token, uh, they rallied behind the victim. 
We found out that the victim was a, was a very well thought of lady. She was friendly, she was regarded as, uh, everyone called her auntie. Police learned Nandita hadn't been herself lately. People around her put it down to the painkillers she'd been on since a recent car accident. Asked if anyone wanted to hurt her, no one speaks up. Apparently, people feel uncomfortable talking about a revered pandit's family tragedy. Except for one young man. He says he used to be Sharma Jr.'s friend. But that was before Jr. decided to show him his latest toy, a stun gun. And he reached out and he nipped him with 50,000 volts very quickly. And he got the shock of his life. It leaves a, like a tiny cigarette burn type of, uh, of mark on an individual's skin when it's applied. Mulligan remembers the marks on Andita's body. Did Shashi Sharma Jr. kill his stepmother? If so, why? In Toronto's Little India, two detectives from Northern Ontario finally have a lead in the Nandita Advani murder case. Nandita's stepson is known to possess stun guns, the kind of weapon police believe the killer used in his attack. So it was critical for us at that point in time to locate these stun guns. The detectives arrive at Shashi Sharma Sr.'s house with a search warrant. The faith healer lets them in. He says Junior is away in Fiji. The detectives ask Sr. to wait outside while they conduct their search. During the course of our search warrant, we, we seized a, a large variety of uh, apparent medicines throughout the house. Mulligan sends the drugs to the lab for analysis. Junior's uh, bedroom is locked up solid. Uh, we have the keys to that from Sharma Senior. It was a normal uh, the bedroom. It was very disheveled, mind you, and, and dirty. It had a, had a stereo system in there, a computer system as well. Junior is a local uh, computer technologist. So he's quite, quite adept in, uh, in electronics. The detectives note something curious about Junior's setup. He had the uh, capability of flipping a toggle switch and being capable of listening to the phone conversation from a phone downstairs. Whenever Mulligan searches a young man's room up north, he finds it pays to check the stereo speakers. It pays in Little India too. Two stun guns were wrapped up inside this plastic bag. The detectives withhold news of their discovery from Sharma Sr. They don't want word getting back to Junior in Fiji. The stun guns are sent to an electronic specialist for analysis. One gun fails to function, but the other produces 50,000 volts from one 9-volt battery. The muscular, the local muscular constructions can be extremely powerful and uh, extremely painful. So when the stun gun is being used for uh, more than a few seconds on, on, on a person, uh, it, it's really accounting for a torture. Investigators compare the electrodes to the marks on the victim's body. The distance between these paired lesions corresponded extremely well with the dimensions of the stun gun in question. The findings don't prove this stun gun was involved in the crime, but dried blood found on the gun's handle might. The blood is sent for DNA analysis. Within a week, Junior returns from Fiji. The detectives put him under surveillance. Junior spends a lot of time helping his father. Basically, Sharma Sr. and Sharma Jr. initially impress us as being almost uh, uh, connected at the hip. The more police see of Sr., the less holy he looks. People would come to him when they couldn't sell their home. They would think that the home was full of evil spirits. So he'd wave some garlic buds around and chant, 
and walk away with a pocket full of cash and a smile on his face. And people honestly believed that, uh, that he had these powers. Police believe Senior is a con artist. Did he lie to them about his role in Nandita's murder? After a week of surveillance, the detectives have noticed something else. Sharma Sr. controls Junior's every move. The father was extremely arrogant and, and domineering over, over Junior. It seems highly unlikely that Junior acted alone. Back at the station house, Mulligan reviews the news videotape made after Nandita went missing. He had described to a T the clothing that she was wearing at the time that she had left the residence on the 27th of November. Now, I don't know about yourself, but I couldn't tell you what my wife wore to work today. And yet he had obviously made note of precisely what she was wearing. Senior makes a point of praising Nandita's good character. Mulligan wants to see that clip again. Nandita was a wonderful during the course of those interviews, he had actually spoken of the victim in the past tense after having just reported her missing. Mulligan has begun to suspect both Senior and Junior are involved in the murder. He gets a call from Dr. Martin Queen. Toxicologic analysis showed elevated level of blood pentazosine, which is a sedating narcotic drug. Pentazosine is the pain reliever Nandita was on after her car accident but the high level makes police think she may have been drugged. Could Sharma Sr. have given her the drug without her knowledge? The victim would have been rendered uh, unable to move uh, her body in a, in a normal manner, almost like a, a drunkenness. But why would the Sharmas want to control her? A phone record check turns up someone who may know. The night before Nandita disappeared, there was a long call from her home to a woman named Tara Mulla. The detectives realize they've already interviewed Tara. Tara admits she knew Nandita better than she first let on. She actually became a friend of the victims as a result of her visiting the pandit, uh, Sharma Sr., in a professional sense. She had some demons she wanted to exercise, and she trusted in his talents. Tara doesn't want to talk about the phone call. She's afraid of retribution from Sharma Sr. People were of the firm belief that he had very significant and mystical powers over them. He indicated to people that he had the power to kill them, and many people were very, very fearful. Sharma Sr. has let it be known he's a master of the dark forces of voodoo. Police have found their investigation into Nandita Advani's murder obstructed. Several potential witnesses have been silenced by their fear of voodoo. It's a new one on Detective Dan Mulligan. This was one of the beliefs that these witnesses were coming out with. These were statements that were coming to us on a daily basis that were beyond belief. But uh, these people honestly believed this individual had these powers. Mulligan does what he always does in these situations. He asks Tara Mulla to do what's right by her friend. Eventually, Tara opens up. The victim confided in this uh, lady on a regular basis and indicated her fear. She wanted to leave. She was desperate to leave this relationship, although she indicated that if I leave, he, he will kill me. The night before she disappeared, Nandita told Tara she thought Sharma Sr. had drugged her. He'd been trying to control her ever since she walked in on him when he was sexually abusing a young girl. She was a witness to the sexual assault. She was going to give evidence against Sharma Sr. in her bid to escape this relationship and convict him. Mulligan finally understands Sharma's motivation for the murder. 
Now that police have uncovered motive and opportunity, they await forensic analysis of the physical evidence. Examination of the blood on the stun guns confirms that it matches the DNA profile of both the victim and Sharma Sr. Sharma Sr.'s DNA sample had been collected in the first 72 hours of the investigation. The brown spots on the victim's hands also turn out to be Sr.'s blood. Police now believe they know what happened to Nandita Idvani. Despite being drugged, Nandita had the strength to call Tara Mulla and confide in her. And Junior's listening to this conversation. She's indicated that uh, she may be providing evidence in, in the sexual assault. That's when it hits the fan. Junior comes running downstairs and, and the scrap is on with, with Senior jumping in. No question that she put up a fight that day, and to the point where uh, Junior had to run back upstairs, get the stun gun to incapacitate her. Later that night, they put Nandita's body in the trunk of Junior's car and drove north of Toronto to cottage country. Removing all her, her, all her jewelry and, and not having any identification on her person was, was their, their means to, uh, to thwart our efforts to identify the body. Not having been to that neck of the woods very often, no doubt they were confident that that body probably would not be located until the following spring when that picnic area was opened up again. Seven months after Nandita's body was discovered, the detectives make the arrests. In certain respects, I think he even had himself fooled. At the time of arrest, he was in fact carrying uh, what he referred to as his charms to ward off evil spirits. Uh, we suggested to him at the time that maybe his charm wasn't working today. Shashi Sharma Jr. pled guilty to manslaughter. His father, Sharma Sr., to second-degree murder. A carefully considered murder plan. A plea to the public. Voodoo threats. In the end, nothing could cover Shashi Sharma's multitude of sins. He died in prison of a heart attack in 2003. The stories on 72 Hours are true. The detectives and forensic scientists are the ones who actually worked on the case. 